Let us pray together. God, we ask that it is you we hear and feel in these words and in this place. Amen. Amen. So today we're going to be talking about Bible study, and so for us to do that effectively, we should probably have the scripture we're going to discuss out in front of us. And so, if you want to, if you brought your Bible or you want to use a pew Bible, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 13. If you brought your copy of Believe, you can find the exact same thing we're going to be talking about on pages 218 and 219. So I'll give you a second to bring all that up. So that's Matthew chapter 13. Is everyone set? I got it. You can bookmark it and set it down. Or you can just hold it open. We're going to start with a story from Chuck Swindle's book called Living Above the Level of Mediocrity. And this is a pretty cool story. He writes... Imagine, if you will, that you work for a company whose president found it necessary to travel out of the country and spend an an extended period of time abroad. And so he says to you, he brings you in with the other trusted employees, and he says, look, I'm going to leave, and while I'm gone, I want you to pay close attention to the business. You manage all of these things while I'm away. I will write to you regularly, and when I do, I will instruct you on what you should do from now until I return from this trip. That makes sense, right? It would probably be emails today, not letters, but that the, that the owner of the company is going to be sending all this, the president. So everyone in the room, including yourself, you agree to that. You say, of course, we're going to follow everything that you write. We will do that. And he leaves and stays gone for a couple of years. And during that time, he writes often, communicating his desires and concerns. And finally, he returns. And he walks up to the front door of the company and immediately discovers that everything is a mess. Weeds flourishing in the flower beds, windows broken across the front of the building, the gal at the front desk is sleeping, loud music roaring from several offices, two or three people engaged in horseplay in the back room, and instead of making a profit, the business has suffered a great loss. So what do you think he does? Fire the ball. Without hesitation, he calls everyone together to figure out what is going on. He says, what happened? Didn't you get my letters? I sent you so many. And they responded, including yourself. We all responded, oh yeah, sure, we got all your letters. We even bound them together in a book. And some of us have memorized them, in fact. And we have every letter. And we have special days where we have letter study on Sundays. And you know, those were really great letters. And the president asked, but what did you do about my instructions? And no doubt we all responded, do? Well, nothing. But we read every single one. So this past week, we've been reading chapter 13 of Believe, and it's on Bible study. What we should do with this book, right? This book of letters and stories that we've been given. Now, some might think that a sermon or a message examining Bible study would probably be pretty dry and boring, right? Maybe you don't think that because you're here. Or you forgot to read and you forgot what it was about, but you're here. But more than that, you might be thinking, That reading and studying scripture isn't as important as something that you can apply to your everyday life, right? You might think that you want something that will help you with your marriage, with your other relationships, with your children, with your work, with your finances, with direction and purpose in your life. And those things are all important. And I believe that scripture has a lot to say about all of those things. Consider this. We all have a cement slab that our house sits on, right? Have you ever seen them building a house and you see that cement slab? That's pretty boring, isn't it? It's just cement. It's flat. It's lifeless. It's so boring. It's basically a small parking lot that a house is going to go on. 
but the cement slab, it may not be as exciting as the kitchen cabinets or the color of the walls or the wallpaper or the decorative moldings, the ceiling fixtures or the carpet or the appliances that you build on top of it. But without that boring cement slab, you can't build anything that will last. Without that foundation, none of those more interesting, more exciting, seemingly more useful things even stand at all. Right? It's just like in Scripture, the, the difference between the man who builds a house on sandy land and the one who builds it on a rock. Or if you don't remember in Scripture, you might remember from that really catchy VBS song. Build your house on the sandy land. Yeah, I've got a couple people nodding. It's in my head now. So we need to develop an, an appreciation for the truths that are present in scriptures, right? The foundations of our faith, the scriptures that speak life into what we do and who we are, because without them, none of the seemingly more interesting, more exciting things, the more applicable things of our Christian lives can stand at all. If we don't have a good foundation in scripture, we can't build anything on top of it that will last. We cannot apply our Christian faith to improved relationships in our lives without having a basis found in Scripture to hold up these things. So as we're going forward this morning, you need to remember that what we're looking at is an essential part of our whole building. It's an essential part of everything we do. So let's get into it with our big question for the week is right at the first page of the chapter, and it says, how do I study God's Word? So how do we study God's Word? It's not rhetorical. I want to know how you study God's Word. We read. We read. We have discussion. Analyze. I like that one. Study help. Study help. Use study helps. So we use other people's words, interpretations, books. We use this right here, right? These things. What else? I heard something else in the back. Go to church. That's a good one. We go to church. We pray. Okay, so we got a pretty good list going of how how we study scripture. But why do we study? And I think this is an easier question to answer because the answer is already on your screen and it's given to you right at the beginning of the chapter, right? Why we should be studying scripture. And it's this week's key idea and it says that I study the Bible to know God and his truth and to find direction for my life. Which is how it's written in our book, but I see that on the slide it's written, I pray to God to know him, to find direction for my life, to lay my requests before him. I feel like they might have messed up the slide and put the wrong thing on it. <laughs> These came with the book study. It should say, I study the Bible to know God and his truth and to find direction for my daily life. There's a, a man, J. Robertson McWilkin, who was a theologian and then a president of a school of, theolo a school of theology that said, Quote, the goal of all Bible study is to apply the truth of Scripture to life. 
if that application is not made, all the work put into making sure of the author's intended meaning will have gone for naught. In fact, to know and not do doubles the offense of disobedience. We follow that quote? The goal of Bible study is to apply Scripture to our everyday life. It is meaningful. It is that foundation on which we can build our faith. But if we do the study part, if we read and pray and discuss and analyze and use other people's helps, and we, and we go to church, but we don't actually follow through on what we're learning, if it doesn't change the way that we act, the way that we behave, if we don't do something about it, then what's the point? Consider the difference between a strong and a weak cup of tea. People here like tea. I prefer coffee. Some people really like tea. The difference, I mean, it's the exact same ingredients that you use for a stronger or a weaker cup of tea, but the difference is that the strong cup of tea results from the tea leaves immersion in the water longer. It's just like we did baptisms last week. Maybe we should have held some people down a little longer, right? I'm joking. That doesn't matter. (laughs) But it becomes stronger tea because the tea is left in the water. The longer steeping process makes that stronger cup of tea. In the same way, the length of time we spend in God's Word determines how deeply we get into it, and it gets into us. It's like the tea, the longer we are in Scripture, the more often we are in Scripture, the stronger we become, the better our foundation. Our gospel reading today shows us how important it is to study the gospel and work at our faiths daily. Jesus sees this large crowd and he begins to teach to them. And this is where you're going to need to pull your Bible back out or your copy of Believe. Because we're going to look at Matthew 13. And first we're going to start with 3 through 9. Jesus says to this crowd, the crowd's so large that he can't talk to them. He's got to go out on a boat to talk back to them as they're on the shore. And he says to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and they ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and they choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Now, if you're talking to theologians or homileticians or pastors, or you're at a divinity school or seminary, they're going to talk about the two different ways that Scripture is digested. And that's through exegesis. My spelling's atrocious, so I better double check that. That is wrong. Exegesis and eisegesis. Have you ever heard of these terms? All study of Scripture falls into one of these two. And there can actually be bleed over between the two from the different forms of criticism that you can apply to Scripture. Criticism, not in the sense that you're criticizing the text, but criticism is a tool to better understand the text. And all study of Scripture falls into one of these two. So let's look at just the portion of Matthew 13 that we read, and it'll help us understand these. We can hear these words and begin to think... I know about birds. Some of the seed fell fell and, and some birds came and ate it. I know about birds. I've seen birds. I see how they operate. And if they ate those seeds, it means that they'll be dropping them somewhere else. So all is not lost. That's a good thing. That's how forests were made. Right? I understand birds. I hear what Jesus said. It's probably a good thing that those birds ate that seed. But I'm not sure that that's what the text is saying. That's me putting my understanding onto the text or reading myself into the text 
which is eisegesis. Reading into the text. That's me putting my thoughts, what I already know, into the text. That's WWJD. Do you guys remember that fad? What would Jesus do? Those bracelets? Here's the issue with that is that when we would say, what would Jesus do? We didn't actually stop to think about what Jesus would actually do. We use it to reaffirm what we were already doing. Obviously, Jesus would do what I'm doing. That's why I'm wearing the bracelet. I'm such a good person for asking that. That's eisegesis. That's me putting myself, my understanding, into the text. Now, what Jesus said in its original context was confusing because the next section of the text says that the disciples came up to him and told him just that. They said, this is really weird. Why are you talking this way? What is the point of using parables? Well, and after Jesus tells them that it's important for them, his disciples, to continue to pursue God and study his words, teachings, and parables, he turns back to the crowd and he explains what he meant about the sower and the seeds. So he's going to give us some context for us to place this text into. And he says, starting in verses 18 and going through 23, he says, Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the words of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet such a person has no root, but only endures for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, This is the one who hears the word, but cares of the world and the lure of the wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for the one who is sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Now, We have enough of this text to kind of let it stand on its own, right? We're starting to understand what Jesus is talking about. We see now that the bird eating the seed isn't a good thing. Even though I know in my life and in my experiences, birds eating seed is what spread vegetation across the world, it's not a good thing in this context. It's a warning to those of us who don't study and read that the word of Christ can become lost to us. Trying our best to let the text speak for itself within its historical, social, religious context, that's called exegesis. And it means along the lines of coming out of the text. We want to see what the text says on its own and how it can speak to us. Trying our best to let it it speak for itself is exegetical. Now there are many forms of criticism that are applied to this exegetical work, but their goal is to remove all of our presuppositions about the text so that it might speak for itself. But many scholars are quick to point out that this is impossible. How can we remove ourselves entirely from reading the text? Not only that, but here's our text, right? These are all of the different forms of criticism that I might use throughout the week. These are the most common ones in my my library that I turn to, as well as some online sources And these are just on Matthew. Everyone here covers the text that we're talking about today. These just deal with Matthew. These are some of the tools that might be used to let the text speak for itself. But the problem is, I can't read Matthew without looking through the lenses of all these other people that I've already read about. I can't read Matthew without thinking about my Sunday school teacher who taught me about Matthew. And she couldn't teach me about Matthew 
most likely, without thinking about the people that taught her and that influenced her. And so we're talking about 2,000 plus years of experience between me and that text. And when I read it, I'm looking through the lens of all of that experience. So it's impossible to be completely exegetical. I would even argue that it's dangerous to try to remove ourselves completely because it removes the personal nature of ourselves in God. It can remove the spirit from the living, breathing word. There's a story about the Prince of Granada, an heir to the Spanish crown, and he was sentenced to life in solitary confinement in Madrid's ancient prison called the Place of the Skull. The fearful, dirty, and dreary nature of the place earned its name, and everybody knew that once you were in, you would never come back out alive. And the prince was given one book to read the entire time, the Bible. With only one book to read, he read it over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, and the book became his constant companion. And after 33 years of imprisonment, he died. And when they came to clean out his cell, they found some notes he had written using nails to mark the soft stone of the prison walls. And the notations were of this sort. Psalm 118 verse 8 is the middle verse in the Bible. Ezra chapter 7 verse 21 contains all the letters of the alphabet except the letter J. The ninth verse of the eighth chapter of Esther is the longest verse in the Bible. No word or name of more than six syllables can be found in the Bible. Now, a psychologist, Scott Udell, noted these facts and wrote about them in Psychology Today, and he noted the oddity of an individual who spent 33 years of his life studying what some have described as the greatest book of all time, and yet only gleaned trivia. From all that we know, the Prince of Granada never made any religious or spiritual commitment to Christ, but he had the Bible, and he became an expert at Bible trivia. Without any personal lens through which we read Scripture, then we might not build a relationship at all. But without placing the text into its proper context and learning more about its original intent, we might be planting those shallow seeds, those seeds of faith that will wither quickly, or ones that are strangled by the thorns and thistles of life. George Barna wrote in the State of the Church in 2002, and I tried to find a newer State of the Church that had the same questions and same information, but I couldn't. So we got to go all the way back to 2002 for these. But he conducted a survey of self-pronounced Christians. So they said, yes, I am a Christian, and then they answered these other questions. And here's what he found out about their knowledge of the Bible. 48% of them could not name the four Gospels. 52% couldn't identify more than two or three of Jesus' disciples. 60% of American Christians can't name even five of the Ten Commandments. And when asking graduating high school born-again Christians, people who said they were born again, over 50% of them thought Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. 61% of American Christians think the Sermon on the Mount was preached by Billy Graham. And 71% of American Christians think God helps those who help themselves is a Bible verse. It is not. It is not in the text. So it's no wonder that George Barna said this. He wrote this about all of this information. Quote, Americans revere the Bible, but by and large, they don't know what it says. And because they don't know it, they have become a nation of biblical illiterates. I would say we've become a nation of dangerous faith. For without that good foundation, everything that's built upon it could crumble and fall or become twisted in a way that's hurtful to God's kingdom. So why do we study Scripture? We talked about the ways how, right? I showed you some of the lenses through which we study Scripture, but why 
I think the answer is really so we're not biblically illiterate. So that we might be that seed that produces 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold or more in our own faithful attitudes of serving God. So that we might learn how to be the best people that God calls us to be. We certainly don't read it for comfort or affirmation in what we already know. Because that alone is a recipe for chaos. Like the company who read all the letters. They studied everything the president sent them. But they never did anything. We certainly don't study scripture so that we can rock the Bible section at trivia night, right? I hope not. We read it because we have ears to listen and eyes to see. We study it because Christ himself calls us to live with him in his word. And we live it because we are called to go and make disciples in all the world, teaching and sharing with all everything that Jesus has taught us. We study the Bible to know God and to know God's truth and to find direction for our daily lives. I pray that we can continue to study Scripture together in ways that are fruitful and helpful in us growing with one another in our faiths so that we see God alive in our lives. Amen.